So you mentioned earlier that uh, you've been to Austin before, mm -hmm. but this is your first time at South by. Yep. So congratulations Thank on you. the slippers. Thank you. And um, uh, what do you what do you love about Austin? Let's start with that. Um, well, Austin just has a really cool art scene. Like it's a really um, artistic community, which I think is really cool. And I love uh, cinema, so there's a great cinema, um, film community here, rather. Um, like the Draft House being one of the best cinemas in the entire world, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. And I'm really happy that I get to screen at a Draft House. That's a really cool honor to get to screen there. Yeah, yeah. that is awesome. Uh, so let's start. Um, what inspired you to make a documentary about the movie Slippers? Uh, well, I read a book all about this. So um, back in 2012, when the shoes sold at auction, mm -hmm. uh, I always kind of followed those auctions because I always thought it was kind of cool that you, you could buy movie props and costumes. And I was reading through the catalog, and there was a little blurb about the shoes and the story about the shoes. And I went and talked to one of my friends who actually wound up being the editor on the movie. And I told him about, you know, I was reading about all this stuff. And he said, oh, there's a book. Oh, okay. No, so he gave me the book, and I read it in I think a day or two. Oh yeah, he's the author. He was one of your interviews. Exactly. So yeah, his book, Reese Thomas's book, it's called The Ruby Slippers of Oz. Um, and I read it in like a day, and I just said, this is this is too good of a story not to tell. It was uh, a real page turner. Yeah, it was a real page turner. And I mean, it's about cinema, it's about Hollywood history and, and and preservation and passion and all that kind of stuff. So I was instantly drawn to it, and I was totally drawn to the character of Kent Warner mm -hmm. and what he did. I just thought it was such a fascinating story. And I love the idea that there's something so weird surrounding something seemingly so innocuous. Like the shoes are just the shoes, but the story surrounding the shoes is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, like I, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know Hollywood movie memorabilia collecting was a thing. <laughs> and it's a big thing. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I really liked learning about uh, Kenneth Warner? Uh, Kent Warner. Kent Warner. Yeah. My bad. No, it's okay. Yeah, I, I was really interested in learning about him. He's a really fascinating character, and the fact that, you know, and, and this is something that I guess goes across time, but the idea that people who believe in something, they're the ones that save things for history. Mm -hmm. And Kent believed in these costumes and the preservation of the costumes, so he saved them for time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. You know, whether he did it, legally or you know when there's like there's a gray area surrounding whatever he did he saved everything for history and I think that's a really beautiful thing and I was totally drawn to that story and that part of the story um, how, how long did it take you to make this film from start to finish like uh, contacting all the interviewees doing the interviews gathering past footage uh, it took years <laughs> so I read the book five years ago okay uh, and then from there, it was probably another two and a half years until I started the process of actually getting it done. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was I contacted Reese, and that was a little difficult because I had no clue how to get in touch with him, so I contacted his publisher, and then they put, he put me in touch with Reese. Mm -hmm. And I basically said, if Reese says no, then I'm not going to do this. And we had talked on the phone, and he said, okay, go for it. Well, great. Uh, and then it was about two and a half years to completion to where we are now. In the process of getting interviews, you know, I, I worked a full-time job when I was doing this, so it was, you know, once in a while I would go off and shoot, and during that time I would contact people and try to get them involved, and it, it, it yeah, it took years, but it was really cool and it was it really was worth so it. It was so much hard work, but it was, it, it was your passion. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, I fell in love with the story, right? And that's what you have to do when you're making a movie, um, especially one that takes as long as it took for me to make, you have to love what you're doing. Yeah. And I fell in love with this story. So that's what kept me going. So early, early on in the film, they stated that the slippers were originally silver. Mm -hmm. And then someone had marked on the screenplay yeah. to make it red? Yeah, so the story goes that, well, I, the film was, was done um, using three-step Technicolor, mm -hmm. which is uh, a process that is very costly, uh, especially back then. So we're talking about... Um, a process that uh, would cost you know four times probably as much as it would to do a regular film, and they had rented these cameras. So uh, MGM had rented basically all of the Technicolor cameras in the world, mm -hmm. and needed to shoot something with them. So they were going to use it for the Wizard of Oz, and when the script came through and they were written silver, 
the story goes that L.B. Mayer himself said, well, I'm not going to spend all this money on a movie and have the main thrust of the story be silver shoes for a big technicolor movie. So he said, figure out another color. And somebody came up with red or ruby and the rest is history. And that's, yeah. And it was just, I think it was just a, you know, a, a quick change. It was nothing that anybody really thought a lot about. But if you really think about it, red is a really great color it, in contrast to every other color that's in that film. It's really dominating. It pops out. Yeah, totally. It. And it's really, you know, it's a beautiful contrast against the yellow brick road. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Didn't think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. If you could purchase any piece of movie memorabilia, but it can't be the red slippers. That's fine. I don't really want the red slippers. <laughs> okay. and, and it's not because I don't think they're important. I just don't want to have them because I'd be terrified of owning them. <laughs> like they're the responsibility of trying to own those things or owning those, like I don't want that responsibility at all. It's, um, from what I learned, it's very overwhelming. It is very overwhelming, yeah. And I mean, you're charged with something that is historically significant, like those shoes you need to keep care of them because they need to be preserved for the rest of time. So imagine being charged with that, that's a huge weight. Um, in terms of what I would like, well, I grew up in the 80s, so I was drawn to you know Star Wars and Indiana Jones, so I, I would love to have Luke Skywalker's lightsaber. That would be one of the coolest things ever. Nice. But the one thing that most people probably wouldn't even think of is I would love to have the copper bones from the Goonies. So that's the little, the, the skull that he puts in and twists around and, and the, the Rube Goldberg machine goes. I'd love to have that. That'd be really cool. But supposedly the story goes that Sean Astin had that. He was given it by the production and his mom didn't know what it was and threw it away. And so it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I know. Isn't that awful? <laughs> and the map. Apparently he, his, her, um, his mom threw the map away as well. So yeah, sad. it's awful. Oh, at least ask. You know? Yeah, really. <laughs> wow. Oh, no. I know, isn't that just awful when you think about it? Oh. So, this is your second film, your second documentary. Yep. Um, do you have, uh, what are your plans for your next project? Do you know what you want to pursue? Will it I, be a feature in another documentary? I don't know. It probably will be another documentary. Uh, I certainly didn't set out with the intention of becoming a documentary filmmaker, but I love it. I've found it's a real passion of mine to tell stories this way and I think it's really cool because you get to play with real life mm -hmm. and I think that's really fun and interesting. I mean um, when you write a script you write it and that's the script. Making a documentary it takes so many twists and turns. When I started it I didn't know that we were going to go diving underwater for the ruby slippers. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and if I was writing it I would never even, even thought to write something as absurd as that. Um, so I really do dig docs, and I think I probably will make another doc, but I don't know what I want to do yet. I have some ideas, but nothing concrete. The thing with, the, with, the, um, with this one is that I read the book and I knew right away, I have to make this into a movie, and I haven't found anything yet that, that st struck me that way. So besides being here for the slippers, do you have any other films that you're interested in watching? Um, oh, there's some cool stuff playing at the festival. Uh, I really want to see the work in progress of Sausage Party, the Seth Rogen movie. That looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, in terms of other docs, what, um, The Liberators, which is the one about the guys finding the stash of um, Nazi uh, stolen art oh, yeah, in Texas that. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, that's just such a great sounding story. I, I really want to see that one. So I think I'll probably go check that out.